get started. So good morning, everyone, or good afternoon now. Uh, my name is Deandra Coleman. I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. And for those of you that are not familiar with our organization, the Virginia SBDC is a partnership program between the U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. With 27 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses in their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one consulting services are available at no charge. Today's webinar, Filling a Provisional or Non-Provisional Utility Patent Application, is presented by the Virginia SBDC in collaboration with the United States Patent and Trademark Office and is the second in a series of four webinars with the USPTO. Before we get started, I just want to mention a couple of housekeeping items. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are recording today's presentation and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants in today's webinar, everyone's microphone is muted. If you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box and time allowing. Our presenter will answer them at the end of the presentation. Today's presentation will be given by Elizabeth Doherty, who is the Eastern Regional Outreach Director for the USPTO. She carries out the strategic direction of the Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the USPTO, and is responsible for leading the USPTO's East Coast stakeholder engagement. Ms. Doherty has had has had more than 25 years of experience working at the USPTO and has developed, implemented, and supervised programs that support the independent inventor community, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and the intellectual property interests of colleges and universities. She has spearheaded a number of special projects with federal, state, and local governments and private organizations to promote and support invention and innovation in the United States. And now I will turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Deandra, and thank you to Amanda. It's my pleasure again to join with the Virginia SBDC to uh, pre present and share information about the importance and role of intellectual property. Um, I'm pleased that we've uh, already conducted a four-part series and we're now into this next four-part series. Uh, and as Deandra alluded to, there are two more parts coming up, one on design patents, which are a really unique way to protect the ornamental appearance of an article of manufacture, oftentimes used in combination and collaboration with a utility patent. So be sure and tune into that if it sounds like something that might be pertinent to the endeavor you're undertaking. Uh, the next one after that will be about prior art searching. Uh, and it's something that's uh, great to learn and you're strongly encouraged before filing an application, which we're gonna talk about today, you're strongly encouraged to do a prior art search. Maybe your idea is just so good, someone's already thought of it. So let's save yourself the heartache, the headache and the financial outlay by doing a good quality prior art search. Uh, I've got lots of slide materials, which I am going to share with Deandra and Amanda to make sure that you, the audience, get these slide materials as well. But with that, let's go ahead and jump right into them because we've got a lot to cover today. All right, here we go. So again, today's topic is filing a provisional or non-provisional utility patent application. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is the different parts of the patent application, the enablement, enablement requirement, the limitation of claims, claims are the name of the game as we'll come to find out, and the importance of capturing the invention using clear and consistent language. So today we are focused on utility applications. Now for any of you who may have turned into, tuned in to the patents basic class that was previously taught, we talked about the fact that there are three types of patents. There are utility patents, there are design patents, and there are plant patents. Utility applications, utility patent applications uh, are the application that you would file to receive a utility patent utility patents covering those things that we generally think of as inventions. A new uh, bike, a, a new cellular communication device, a new mousetrap, a new toothbrush. Um, so they protect inventions really in that true sense of the word that we think of, that, that hard item, that, uh, that, that piece of real property that you might own, that, that item, that piece of that article of manufacture, um, so they are covered by utility applications. Now, of course, it can also protect 
processes, methods of manufacture, uh, as well as improvements thereof. So again, we are talking today about utility applications, and we are talking about provisional patent applications and non-provisional. And I want to be sure that everyone walks away with a clear understanding and appreciation of the difference between a provisional and a non-provisional. As you can see here on the screen, we do have an example of a really clever, really fun utility, utility patent that is, in fact, for a snowman accessory kit. Uh, as one might imagine, you could build a snowman out of three balls of snow. This snowman accessory kit comprises the uh, coal that's used for his buttons, his eyes, and his mouth, as well as a corn cob pipe, uh, a uh, nose piece, a scarf, and a hat. Um, again, it is an article of manufacture, and in fact, this one is a kit, a kit article of manufacture. So just at a very high level, provisional patent applications are something that are not examined or published. They are good for a one-year period of time, and they are only good for utility patents. So again, keep in mind the two other types of, of patents, design and plant, you cannot file a provisional application for a design or a plant. The non-provisional application, that is what is examined by one of our over 8,500 engineers and scientists who serve as US patent examiners, examining US patent applications every day of the week. These are examined and can result in a US patent and they are published at 18 months from the earliest filing date unless, unless you as the applicant requests non-publication. It didn't used to be that we published applications. However, um, in a uh, effort to further harmonize with uh, the rest of the globe, many of which publish their applications, and also to create a more, a more complete repository of technological invention, we began publishing patent applications. This way, even if a non-provisional patent application does not result in a US patent, we still have the wealth of information that is in that published patent application. So let's talk first about that provisional patent application. So again, you are not required to file a provisional patent application if you want to receive a US patent. This provisional patent application, I like to say, is an opportunity. It is an optional application you can file if you want to get something on file, perhaps a little bit more quickly and with a little bit uh, lower barrier to entry and a little less cost to get something on file with the US Patent and Trademark Office. Let's say you're gonna have a conversation tomorrow with someone you want to help uh, commercialize your invention or someone you want to have help uh, financially underpin your invention, but you wanna to talk to them while also having something on file with the US Patent and Trademark Office. It's gonna to be tough to file that non-provisional just because of the level of specificity it requires. However, you might be able to file at least a minimal provisional patent application to get that on in with the USPTO to begin using the term patent pending and to talk with a certain level of protection as you talk to people outside of your circle of confidentiality. So the re law requires that for a provisional patent application that you file a clear indication that you are filing a provisional patent application. You do not want the USPTO to think that this is a non-provisional because it will result in problems. It will result in the application being published and it will also uh, incur additional fees. So there must be a clear indication that you are filing a provisional. And the best way to do that is using our cover sheet. And I'm gonna show you that. Uh, or at least let you know that there is a cover sheet that you should be using. There is a fee and the fee is distinctly different than the fee of the non-provisional. The provisional patent application fee is substantially less. You must have a description of the invention which must enable someone to make and use the invention. So what this is telling us is that this can't be a back of the napkin that you just throw into the US Patent and Trademark Office with a couple of details about your idea it does have to have a certain level of specificity. That level of specificity must enable someone to make and use the invention. So you must dis disclose it with that level of information and a drawing if necessary to understand the invention. And that is true as well of the non-provisional. If your invention can be depicted in drawings, you are required to file drawings with your application. So the pr provisional patent application requirement, as I mentioned, there is a cover sheet. 
And this is where you're going to let us know that you are filing a provisional patent application. That provisional cover sheet is PTO form SB16. There you're going to provide the inventor names, your residence, the title of your invention. And let's keep in mind the title of in your invention is not Sam's super cool new bicycle, but it's going to be a descriptive technical title. Uh, bicycle uh, having four wheels. Um, you're going to file a correspondence address so we know where to correspond with you, the applicant. Attorney information, if you are using a registered patent attorney or patent agent, and any US government interest if you are being uh, receiving government funding for your invention. So again, let's be clear about the difference between the provisional and the non-provisional. They're both extremely valuable tools and they're both tools in this innovation life cycle of leading up to protecting an invention. Um, however, it's important to note that the provisional is automatically abandoned after one year meaning it only lasts for a year. So it is a one year placeholder with the US Patent and Trademark Office. Claims are not required, although many times applicants when filing their provisional, in fact, do file claims. There's a couple of different schools of thought on this and I'll just give you some anecdotal information. Sometimes uh, individuals uh, would suggest that uh, no claims are necessary because again, this is something we're going to do quickly, you're going to do cheaply. There's another school of thought that why not make your provisional of such high quality that when you decide to file your non-provisional, you really already have the template in place. You really already have such a high quality application that you can really just add perhaps a little more specificity, um, add the additional fees, the additional uh, information that's required, but it's still already pretty much drafted. And in some schools of thought, you might save yourself money in doing that by having that high quality provisional, which doesn't require a complete rewrite for the non-provisional. Now the non-provisional requires that there is at least one claim. And for a basic filing fee, you are entitled to 20 claims total, three independent and 20 claims total. Uh, you must have a written disclosure that meets this, the requirements of 112 first paragraph or 112 second paragraph. Again, that is that um, you must uh, disclose your invention with such specificity that others can make and use. This non-provisional, as I mentioned, is examined for patentability and can result in a patent. This is what is picked up by a U.S. patent examiner. So we do have something called the non-provisional patent application filing guide. We used to give these out in hard copy. Now we encourage applicants to download it off our website. Um, and it provides you a walkthrough of what uh, what is necessary for a non-provisional patent application. And we're gonna talk about it, a lot of it today, but if you'd like to also have that application filing guide at your fingertips, I encourage you to download it from our website. So let's take a quick look at a patent. For those of you who may not have seen a patent, you may just be considering the idea of seeking a US patent. Well, here's an exemplary patent right here uh, for a computer system. Uh, in looking at the face of the patent, you'll see that there's several uh, things that are required. And these things are required and they're required in all patents uh, because we want to maintain that uniformity of look and feel so people know the information that's being disclosed, they know where to find that information that's being disclosed, and they know what you are claiming is your invention. So there is an abstract, uh, which is a short 150 word or less summary of the invention. When you pick up a patent, you can read that brief summary to understand what the invention is about. The written description, that is in your specification and that is going to be the bulk of your application. That's where you're going to tell us uh, in great detail about your invention. Uh, drawings, if you can depict your invention in drawings, drawings are required. And then of course, claims. The claims, again, are the name of the game. They define the legal boundaries of the invention. Uh, is this as similar to the deed of a property? So if you were to look at the deed of your property, you would know where you, the, the confines of your property, property start and stop. Where can you put a driveway? Where can you put a fence? You would look to your deed of real property to determine those boundaries. So as I said, you are going to file a specification and the specification is in fact your disclosure. It is the written description of the invention, how to make and use that invention, 
using clear, full, concise, and exact terms. While you are entitled to being what we call your own lexicographer, using terms as you see fit, I would strongly encourage you to not make up terms and to use terms that are understood or that are in the technology space that you are inventing in. There must be at least one specific embodiment and conclude with at least one claim. Again, as I mentioned, for your filing fee, you are entitled to up to 20 claims, th three of which can be independent. Now, that's not to say that you can't have more than 20 claims because you can. It's just going to cost you additional money. So the specification page format. Now, this is probably a good place to interject the fact that 99.9% .9 of our applications come in electronically. They are filed electronically, processed electronically. Um, so with that said, um, keep in mind that you are going to want to spend a little bit of time familiarizing yourself with our electronic filing system. Now we are in the process of actually uh, beta testing a new filing system. And I encourage you to visit Patent Center, which is on our webpage, which is our new uh, means for filing an application, as well as also keeping track of all of the information of your application. Our old system, which is still in use, is the EFS Web, Electronic Filing System, which is web-based. So your specification, including the abstract and claims, must have lines that are uh, 1.5 or double-spaced in a single column of text, written on only one side in portrait orientation, eight by five, eight and a half by 11 inch margin paper. Again, keep in mind that we are doing this electronically now, although you could still submit in paper. In our Alexandria headquarters, we do have a walk-up window where you can file in paper and you can mail in a paper application. Again, very few of our applicants are doing that now. Application pages must be numbered and you must use a non-script font. These are all pretty basic requirements if you filed a term paper recently or filed a patent application. Specification sections. And this is where when I showed you the cover of a patent, you saw some of those uh, sections kind of called out. Um, and again, Many people say, why do patents have to be so complicated? Why does it sound like so much legalese? Why is it so formalistic? Well, it's formalistic in part, again, to reflect the information that is required to share with the public your knowledge of your invention and to share with your invention, uh, to share of your invention at such a level that others can make and use, which is required for us to uh, issue you a US patent. That's one of the requirements that you must disclose it with that specificity because this is a quid pro quo system, a this for that system. In exchange for you disclosing with that specificity, uh, we will allow you to exclude others from using your invention, making, using, selling, importing your invention without your permission for a limited period of time in that exchange. The claims must appear on a separate sheet. And remember that abstract of less than 150 words is one paragraph also on a separate sheet. The title of the invention, as I said, it should not be Sam's super new swanky bike. It should be short and specific. So think of it as a quick description, avoid generic language and allow people to readily ascertain what your invention is, whether it's a toothbrush or a hair clip or a cell phone. Lesser use sections, but sections that you can have in your disclosure is cross references to related applications. Perhaps you are creating a patent portfolio and you have a number of applications that are all within a similar area of technology. These applications are related to one another uh, because they're either divisional or continuation applications. Here's where you could call those out if you would like to. A statement regarding federally sponsored research. Again, if you're receiving federal funding for your invention, and for the research, which is the foundation of that invention, uh, you must call that out. Names of parties to a joint research agreement uh, and incorporation by reference of material uh, that is submitted in a form other than the paper or the electronic file that you have provided. Uh, statement regarding prior disclosure by the inventor or joint invent and in, joint uh, joined in that should be joint inventor. Um, uh, if there is uh, something previous disclosed that you would like to also uh, call out in this application, you can as well. And then of course, a sequence listing if you are inventing in the life sciences. Background of the invention. 
this is kind of the start of your specification. And this is where you can set the tone to describe the field of invention. What is the area of uh, technology that you are inventing in? You can also provide a description of related art. Um, if you want to, again, set the tone for what has been done before your invention and why, in fact, you are doing what you are doing. The brief summary of the invention. This describes at a high level your invention. This is different than the abstract because the abstract is going to appear on the face of your patent. Um, this is, again, in the specification, and it is that brief snapshot of your invention. Uh, you can identify the problems you're solving, what makes your invention special or different, and how your invention does what it does. Again, this is just a very brief because you're then going to follow it by a detailed description of the invention. So if you would like to call out at a very high level to again alert the reader of the patent to what you uh, have done or in what you are doing and what problems you are solving. Similarly, uh, there is a brief description of the drawings where again you are going to identify and call out the various figures that you have and provide a brief indication of what is in each of those drawings. You will then also have drawings. Again, remember I, I've said uh, uh, previously that if you have uh, the ability to depict your invention in drawings, you are required to do so. Now with that said, um, drawings, um, you can do them yourself. Um, the standard for drawings over time has be become relaxed. It used to be you had to use an official draftsman. Um, however, we have now relaxed that standard and applicants themselves can produce their own drawings. And with that said, there are now a number of um, programs, uh, CAD, CAD systems, things that you can access. So we strongly encourage you to supply the best quality drawings that you can. Again, you can hand draw them yourself, um, but we would encourage you to supply as good a quality drawings as possible because they are going to become part of the record of your invention. They are going to become part of your issued patent. They are certainly part of your patent application. So we would encourage you uh, to, to obtain the best quality drawings, whether you do them yourself, you obtain the assistance of a draftsman, or you uh, use this uh, some type of a drawing system. Um, again, they must show every feature of the invention and you're going to provide indicia that call out each of the different features uh, that are in those drawings. Uh, may contain as many views as necessary to show the invention. So there is no limit to the number of drawings you can have, but of course, let's, let's be reasonable. Drawing requirements. Uh, they should be black and white unless you file a petition to do otherwise. There are certain exceptions where one can file drawings that are photographs or uh, other types of descriptive items, uh, but that would require a petition. Um, and that would go through our Office of Petitions and you can find that information on our website. As I said, you must use reference characters or indicia numerals identifying um, the various features of each drawing. Each figure must be labeled and avoid using descriptive words in the figures. Remember, you're gonna have that brief description of the drawings and you're going to have the more detailed description of the drawings within the specification. So you aren't going to have uh, a lot of text, perhaps a little text, but not a lot of text in the drawings themselves. The abstract, returning back to our friend, the brief abstract must start on a separate sheet with a heading, the term abstract. We want you to call it out so we know that's what it is. Must be 150 words or less. It's a single paragraph pointing out what is new in the technology. Again, this is your thumbnail sketch of what your invention is. And when somebody picks up your patent, they're going to take a quick look and see that that's what your invention is. The detailed description of the invention. So this is really the body of your specification. This is really the bulk of what you are disclosing up until the claims which are at the end of your application and which uh, are published again at the end of your patent. Very, very important. This is where you are going to explain the invention and the process of making and using it again in full, clear, concise, and exact terms. You can't tell us just a little bit about your invention. You have to tell us everything about your invention. So focus on explaining the structures, processes, or compositions of the invention. 
refer to the figures if applicable, and explain the different parts by using those reference numerals. So as you walk through this detailed description, you are going to call out the various figures that you have applied, the various drawings that you have supplied, and as you are describing the invention and its construction and its process of making and using, you will refer to those various drawings. Detailed description of the invention. Uh, the detailed description, again, going uh, in greater depth, should provide clear support or antecedent basis for all terms used in the claims. So jumping ahead to that concept of the claims, remember the claims are the name of the game and what clearly set forth the meets and bounds of your invention. Anything that is in the claims must be found in the detailed description, must be found in the specification. So let's say you have inv invented a new snowman accessory kit. Um, and in the specification, you describe the various features of the coal uh, type buttons, the, the wooden carrot for the nose, the corn cob pipe, the hat and the scarf. But then in your claims, you refer to a tote bag that the, uh, that you've, that's also being provided as part of the accessory kit. That's going to be a problem. You need to have, again, clear support for all terms in the claims in the detailed description. So you need to be sure that that tote bag, if that is part of the accessory kit, whether it holds all of the items for creating a snowman or whether it's a, a tote bag for the snowman himself to have, uh, you need to have that in the body of the description. So anecdotally, some folks find that it's helpful to draft the claims first. Again, I think that's a, a matter of uh, style, a matter of preference, um, and something that, you know, it might depend on the particular patent attorney or patent agent that you choose to use. Now, this is probably a good place actually to, to have a call out re regarding patent attorneys and patent agents. So you are not required by law to use a patent attorney or patent agent. However, with that said, the US Patent and Trademark Office strongly encourages you if you are seeking patent protection to use a registered patent attorney or patent agent. Now I use the term registered. That's because in order to practice before the US Patent and Trademark Office in the area of patents, you have to be registered, meaning you have passed a certification exam that is offered by the US Patent and Trademark Office and you have to have a degree that is in one of the recognized sciences that we specifically call out. Uh, the exam that we have is conducted by our Office of Enrollment and Discipline, and they also supervise and oversee the attorneys and agents that are part of the registered patent attorney and agent core. Um, I also, you may know, I use the term patent attorney or patent agent. Uh, a patent agent is someone who has passed the USPTO certification exam has a degree in one of the recognized sciences, but is not an attorney. Oftentimes law firms will employ both patent attorneys and patent agents. Sometimes a patent agent can be cheaper than using a patent attorney. Patent agents can do nearly everything a patent attorney can do, except with the exception of taking, uh, of appearing or representing you in court. So you could have a patent agent prosecute a file and prosecute your patent application. However, if someone infringed upon your patent or claimed that your patent was invalid, you could not have that patent agent represent you in court. So just important to keep in mind. Keep in mind the concept of looking for a good patent attorney or patent agent, because as you've probably already started to, to gather from our conversation today, seeking a patent can be and is a complex process. Um, it's a process with a lot of formality. It's a process um, that's governed by a number of laws and rules. So uh, to give yourself the best fighting chance, you're strongly encouraged to use a patent attorney or patent agent. But with that said, don't be dismayed. People do file applications without an attorney or agent and do it successfully. So I'm sure if that's something you wanna under undertake, we are here to help you. Uh, and we do have resources at the USPTO that helps what we call pro se applicants, applicants that are filing without an attorney or agent. Oh, so with that said, let's go back to some specification dues. We're gonna talk about some dues and some don'ts. 
do. And these are your takeaways. The, if you remember nothing else from the presentation today, let's remember the do's. Do describe the invention clearly to allow any person skilled in the art to make and use the invention without undue experimentation. Remember, quid pro quo system, you must disclose. When referencing the drawings, be sure that each reference numeral is used for only one part depicted in the drawings. Do not duplicate numbers. I know it would just be a simple error, but do not do it because it could cause your drawings to get uh, an objection and then you would have to deal with that. Provide at least one specific embodiment. Make sure there is a brief description of the drawing section. Provide proper antecedent basis for all the terms in the claims and focus on the technical features of the invention. So what are some of our specification cautions? Again, these are your don'ts. Um, try not to, and please do not use trademarks in the title or to describe a structure or use a mark um, you intend to register for a commercialized product. This is a patent application. You should be using technical terms. You should not be using trademarks, especially the trademarks that belong to others. Uh, the background of the invention section does not need to state how the inventor conceived of the idea. Um, sometimes folks do put that in there, but again, it's not needed and probably not advised. Avoid making claims of possible future success. Um, while we certainly wish you that success, um, don't include it. Um, again, it's that prophetic statement that probably really doesn't go to the, the, the technical features of your invention. Uh, do not include a detailed discussion of the figures or refer to the reference uh, characters in the brief description of the drawings. That again is going to go in the more detailed description, the body of the specification. And do not forget to proofread your specification. I know most of us have the benefit of using spell check, um, but do be sure and give your application uh, a couple once overs before you turn it in. Claims. So let's get to the claims, which are the name of the game. So if it is in the claim, it must be in the specification. Remember, we talked about how the specification must have anything that is going to appear in the claims. It must provide the basis for something that is in the claims. Claims define the invention and what aspects are legally enforceable. Remember again, the claims form the meets and bounds of your invention. They must conform to the invention as set forth in the remainder of the specification. Terms and phrases used in the claims must find clear support or antecedent basis in the description. Uh, again, that's, that's that call out that the information must be in the specification to also be in the claims. Let's take a look at a sample claim. And I think this is important because again, if you're not familiar with patents, you're gonna find that claim language is just different. Claim language is not how we speak. It's not you know, the vernacular that we usually use. Uh, and the example we have here is a swivel chair. Now, let me tell you right up front, if you ask me to describe my swivel chair at my desk to you, I would not describe it in this way. A chair comprising a seat, a back support attached to the seat, support arms attached to the seat and back support, and a base comprising a plurality of legs attached to the seat. Now, I think the takeaway here is that, yes, we are using very technical terms, a seat, a back support, support arms, a base, legs attached to the seat. Um, we're not describing it as a, uh, a comfy back portion, a squishy seat, a colorful leather seat. Um, these are technical terms that describe the invention and tell us again how, uh, how the invention is. How is it put together? What are the components of this swivel chair? So the form of a claim or the form of the claims, the claims are going to be on a separate sheet, separate from the rest of the body of your specification. Similarly, they should be uh, one and a half or double spaced. Each claim is a single sentence. And we'll go back to our example here. As you notice, this is a single sentence, a claim, a chair comprising a seat, a back, a support arms and a base attached to the seat period. Um, 
and it begins with a capital letter and ends with a period. Uh, as I mentioned before, for your uh, initial filing fee, you are entitled to three independent claims and 20 claims total before we charge you extra. Now, there are applications that come in with hundreds or thousands of, of claims. And again, if you feel that that is what is necessary to truly claim your invention, then have at it. Um, it's going to cost you. So just kind of a word of thumb, uh, particularly where finances are an issue. Um, and really, you should also ask yourself, is that number of claims really necessary to really lay out what your invention is? Uh, they should be numbered consecutively in an ascending order. Uh, original numbering is preserved throughout the prosecution. So US patent law requirements, because remember I mentioned that um, the complexity of filing a patent application, whether a provisional or a non-provisional, is based in part that, you know, there are a number of statutes, statutes being laws, and rules, the Code of Federal Regulations that govern patent practice. So US patent law requires that a non-provisional patent application must have at least one claim. Uh, we've talked about that. You could have up to 20 for that initial filing fee. The claim may be written in independent or dependent form. A dependent claim refers to a claim previously set forth and then further limits the claimed invention. A claim in dependent form incorporates by reference all of the limitations of the claim to which it refers. So when we're talking about claims, uh, I think this is a good uh, visual for us. You want your claims to fall right in that center section, right in that sweet spot. You don't want them to be too specific because if they are too specific, then it will be easy for others to invent around you. If your claim has such specificity, now again, I know I told you your specification much ha much, must have great specificity. If your claims are too nuanced, there's too much detail, again, it'll be easy for people to invent around you because all they'll need to do is, is create something that um, is slightly different than all of those specific features you've called out. Now, however, if your claims are too general, they are not going to be valuable. They are not going to be patentable because your claim may cover the universe of technology. Uh, if your claim to a uh, bicycle simply reads um, a bicycle comprising uh, uh, a body and two wheels, that's too general because that is going to cover every two-wheeled uh, metal-bodied transportation means that's already out there. So again, drafting claims is perhaps the, one of the hardest parts, and I think it's probably safe to say, the hardest part of filing a patent application. And this is really where patent attorneys um, earn their bread and butter, is in the claim drafting. So before drafting claims, there's some considerations to keep in mind. What is the invention? What are the pieces and parts that make up the invention? How do they relate to one another? Do you have more than one invention? Um, and this is where you may have the invention and the method of making that invention. Are there multiple versions of the invention? So think strategically. You're gonna wanna lay out your claims in a strategic fashion. Um, make a claim tree, as we would call it in the, in, uh, the US Patent and Trademark Office. Lay them out. Uh, having the broadest valid claim possible, and then a number of that trickle down from it that add additional levels of detail. So how much can you afford to spend on claims? So again, uh, this is where we have that conversation of, do you need more than the 20 that you are given for the initial filing fee? For independent claims in excess of the three that you're given right up front, it's $115 per claim. Uh, total claims in excess of 20, uh, $25 per claim. So once you go above the 20, there is a $25 charge per claim. So claim drafting, uh, if we go back to our chair example, there are different parts to a claim. Uh, a claim generally has three main parts, the preamble or introduction, a chair comprise a chair, uh, or the, that is the introduction, the transitional phrase, uh, for example, comprising or consisting of, and a body reciting the elements of the invention. 
So in the example we had, and I'll just bounce back here very quickly, um, we have a chair. That is our introduction, a chair. So that sets the tone, the introduction of what the technology is. Comprising is our transitional phrase. And remember the word comprising is an open phrase. So what that means is in this example, a chair comprising these individual components could also have additional features. But here's the ones we're calling out in this claim. And again, because it's claim one and it's an independent claim, this is a very broad claim. Now, if you had said a chair consisting of, that would suggest that there were no additional features to this chair. So let's go back to our claim drafting. So comprising or which comprises is most commonly used. It is open-ended. It encompasses all of the listed elements and potentially more. Consisting of is close-ended. Um, and it depends on what you're doing as to which of these would be most appropriate to your situation. Uh, here's another example claim just without the, uh, the image of our chair. A shovel comprising a handle and a blade having a point thereon. The preamble, like our chair, is a shovel. It sets the tone for what the invention is. Comprising, the transitional phrase, and a handle and a blade having a point thereon is the body of the claim. So remember, here's some of your takeaways. We had them with respect to uh, the specification. We have them with respect to the claims. Claim dues, claim drafting dues. Particularly point out and distinctly claim the subject matter regarded as the invention. Because again, remember, the claims are the meets and bounds of your invention. So whatever you want your invention to be known for, whatever you want uh, individuals who are looking at your patent and trying to determine what your invention is, make sure to put it in the claims. Don't just have it in the specification, but put it into the claims, whether in a independent claim or a dependent claim. Consider drafting your claims first and then your specification based on terms used in the claims. Again, I think that's a matter of drafting preference. Review both to make uh, necessary additions and corrections so that the claim terms find support in the specification. Remember, you cannot put anything into the claims that has not previously appeared in the specification. No surprises in the claims is the way we like to think of it. Look at the claims and patents issued in your field of technology. And this is a strong recommendation, particularly those of you who are thinking about patenting for the first time. I strongly encourage you to go to our USPTO uh, webpage and uh, do some patent searching or use Google Patents or any of the other uh, uh, services uh, to uh, allow you to look at US or foreign patents, but particularly look at US patents in your field of endeavor, whether you're inventing a new mousetrap or a new toothbrush, look at patents in your field, look at the terminology they, they use, uh, look at the technology that is being patented. One, it's a great way to find um, additional ideas. It's a great way to find something that you might want to improve upon, but it's also a great way to determine how the individuals that are working in your space of endeavor are claiming their inventions. Ensure each term has proper antecedent basis. Again, this goes back to making sure everything is in your specification if it is going to be found in your claims. Think about what legal protection you need for your invention and tailor your claims accordingly. Um, and this is again, kind of having a knowledge of the space in which you're inventing. Is it a space where there is a heavy level of invention? Is it a space where there's a lot of uh, room to, to move and room to grow? Know, uh, really know what you're undertaking here. Some claim drafting cautions. Do not use claims covering two statutory classes of invention. This is where you will get a rejection from the US Patent and Trademark Office from the examiner who is examining your application. Um, and not to say that it couldn't be corrected after the fact, but let's go ahead and get it right from the get go. So if you are claiming two different statutory classes of invention, for example, the article of manufacture and the method of manufacturing it, break that up into two different sets of claims within your 20 claims. Uh, do not use terms inconsist inconsistently between the claims and or the specification. So if you call something in the specification, be sure and use that same terminology in the claims. 
Now, uh, obviously, uh, you know, we can call something a cap or a ball cap or a hat. Pick one and go with it, depending on how you have chosen to describe your invention. Do not write multi-sentence claims. Remember your claims, each claim is a single sentence beginning with a capital and ending with a period. Do not refer back to only a portion of another claim in a dependent claim, uh, the widget of the apparatus of claim one. So uh, it's unfortunate that I don't think in this slide set we have a good example of independent versus dependent claims. We touched on it in a couple of slides back, but I don't know that that clearly really laid out um, the concept. Um, so again, an independent claim is a standalone claim. Think of our chair example. Think of the shovel example. Now, if we had dependent claims to, those, to the chair or to the shovel, they would be claims that referred back to that claim and added additional detail. So actually, if we want to, let's jump back to our shovel. So this claim is an independent claim given the way that it's drafted and it does not refer to any preceding claim. A shovel comprising a handle and a blade having a point thereon. But let's say our shovel has some additional features and you want to put those into dependent claims. And dependent claims can be very valuable because they offer greater levels of detail, greater levels of specificity without uh, necessary with also allowing you to have this broad independent claim. And what you hope is that you hope the US patent examiner who examines your application is going to grant this broadest independent claim. But if they come back and they've found prior art and they say, no, uh, you're not entitled to a patent on your shovel comprising a handle and a blade having a point thereon, you may be able to amend your claims to take an additional detail out of a dependent claim amend your claims to take that detail and put it into this independent claim to arrive at something that is patentably distinct. So let's say you had a dependent claim where you said um, the, bla uh, the blade has a star-shaped point there on. That would be an additional feature of detail. So perhaps there is some novel feature in having the point be shaped like a star. Perhaps it lets you cut into really hard, rocky soil much better than just having a single point. By having a star-shaped point that has multiple points to break up the earth, perhaps there is, a, there is a, an additional feature there that makes your invention unique. So that dependent claim would read a shovel comprising a hand, um, so uh, again, your dependent claim would refer to the claim of claim one, the shovel of claim one, wherein the blade has a star-shaped point thereon. So uh, again, there's the distinction between independent claims and dependent claims. And uh, I have to give you some more, um, it's unfortunate that those, we don't have any examples, better examples for you as a takeaway in these slides. Um, before we run out of time, and I want to be sure to allow time for questions, I do want to hit very quickly um, some resources of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to help those of you who are just getting started out or perhaps are somewhere in the process. Now, you may have participated in a program that we've done before where we talked about a wealth of these resources. So if this is repetitive, my apologies to you, but it can't hurt to hear it a second time uh, for those of you who have heard it before. Um, these are some resources that are specifically drawn towards helping you in the patent application process. Uh, first and foremost, we have something called the Inventors Assistance Center, our IAC. The IAC is staffed by retired supervisory patent examiners and primary examiners who served 20, 30, 40 year careers at the US Patent and Trademark Office, who are extremely knowledgeable in patent prosecution and are there to answer your question Monday through Friday. They love to get your calls and you can call them about anything regarding patents. Whether you have filed, you are preparing to file, your application is in prosecution. Now they may, if your application is already in prosecution, refer you to the patent examiner who is handling your case, but they may also be willing to help you. We also have the USPTO Patent Pro Bono Program. As a result of the America Inven Invents Act of 2011, 
Congress urged the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to work with legal organizations across the nation to stand up patent pro bono programs such that under-resourced inventors did not leave technologies on the kitchen table or the garage workbench because they were financially under-resourced. So these programs cover the nation. Some are state programs, some are regional programs. For those of you who are tuning in from Virginia or the wider DMV, we do have a pro bono program that is uh, run by the Federal Circuit Bar Association. And you can find this on our website. And I encourage you, uh, if you need to take advantage of their services, please apply to the program. As I mentioned, the programs are nationwide and available throughout the country. We also have a, a corollary program and that is law school clinical programs. And these are law schools that have IP clinics that allow students to work with registered practitioners or professors who are registered to do uh, uh, help you prepare a patent application. Um, like the pro bono program, uh, in the law school clinic program, you would have to pay the fees to the USPTO, but your legal costs would be zero or minimal. Um, and again, you can find this information on our website as well. One caveat of the law school clinics, or maybe um, something just to point out for your reference, is that sometimes if you uh, make too much money to be taken on by the pro bono program in your area, sometimes the law school clinics do not have the same financial cap. So perhaps if you make too much money to take advantage of the pro bono program, it's worth checking out a law school clinic in your area. We also have something called Patent and Trademark Resource Centers. Uh, if you remember during our conversation today, I spoke about doing a high quality patent search prior to filing an application. Remember, you're not required to do so, but you're strongly encouraged to do so. Um, to get help in developing a high quality patent search, we encourage you to visit a Patent and Trademark Resource Center in your area. There are over 80 located nationwide, and they're generally at university libraries. They are all at publicly available libraries, but they are generally at university libraries where there may be uh, a technical library or a business library. These libraries all have one, if not more than one, uh, librarian who is trained in patent and trademark searching. Now, they won't conduct the search for you. However, they will help you to set up a high quality patent search. Last but not least, I wanna leave you with some additional resources. Uh, this is our 1-800 helpline. If uh, they will refer your call to the right part of the US Patent and Trademark Office to get you the assistance you need. And then there's a number of other links. And again, I'm going to provide these slides to uh, Deandra and uh, Amanda to be sure to provide to you as attendees. Um, we have our utility patent application guide that I referenced earlier. There's information about the patent process and what that process looks like. Let me let you know that that process is a process of communication and collaboration. We see, as the US Patent and Trademark Office, we see ourselves in this with you. We want the same thing you want. We want to issue you a valid US patent that you can take to the bank and not to the courthouse. We want to issue you a patent if you are entitled to one. We have a patent search guide. Um, and as I mentioned in our upcoming collaborative series with the Virginia SBDC, we will be teaching a class on prior art searching. That class will be in, I believe, two weeks. For those of you who are also pursuing a trademark, we have a trademark assistance center, which is like our inventors assistance center, but for trademarks. We have an IP awareness assessment tool. This tool is really helpful to someone who is uh, perhaps beginning or has already started a business and wants to distinguish and determine what types of intellectual property you may be creating in your endeavor. By taking a 30 minute quiz, you can discern if you are creating intellectual property that should be protected by a patent, a trademark, a copyright, or a trade secret. Uh, so I encourage you to, to do that to better appreciate and understand the intellectual property you may be creating. Again, uh, inventors and entrepreneurs resources, that site on our website is a page where we have created a one-stop shop of getting started as an inventor and entrepreneur. Pro se assistance, as I mentioned, those are applicants who are going the road alone without a patent attorney or patent agent, and we have additional resources for them. Information about our micro entity uh, fee, 
A micro entity is a fee category for uh, inventors. And if you are entitled to claiming status as a micro entity, I encourage you to, to do so because you can pay fees reduced by 75%. Patent pro bono help, we've talked about that. First inventor to file, that's the system where you're working under at this time. And of course, our law school clinic program. Uh, let me just leave you with some uh, additional links. And I am going to stop sharing. So we have a few minutes left for questions. Can you hear me, Elizabeth? I sure can. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Had a little audio trouble again. <laughs> oh, no. Good timing. All right. Um, question here. Uh, what part of the process results in the famous patent pending designation? Oh, that's a great question. And I'm sorry, I didn't touch on it. So anytime you have an application pending before the US Patent and Trademark Office, you can use the term patent pending. So that is true whether you have filed a provisional patent application, which remember is only good for a year. So only during that year can you use the term patent pending or when you have a non-provisional patent application pending. Now, once you receive a notice that your patent has issued, of course, you're going to use the US patent number. You would no longer use the term patent pending or you find out that, um, uh, or you decide to abandon your application. Once you abandon your application because you decide to not pursue it any further, you no longer have an application pending. So you cannot use that term. But so patent pending, please use it if you're entitled to. Again, it's any time you have an application provisional or non-provisional pending before the office. Uh, if the provisional application is not examined or published, what bearing does it have on the non-provisional? Great question. Uh, I love, uh, Deandra, I love your audiences because they ask such smart questions and they ask such intuitive, interesting questions. Um, so the provisional patent application, again, I like to say it's an opportunity. Some people use that provisional application because they're just not sure. They're not sure they wanna go down the road of the investment in filing for a non-provisional because one, they may uh, they need additional financial assistance because they don't know if they are ever going to be able to, if they even got a patent, be able to commercialize this patent and take it to the next level. So they're still seeing financial backing. They may be seeking whether there's anyone even interested in their product. Maybe you've invented something great, but you're ahead of your time or you're behind the time. Maybe there's not a commercial market for your patent. This provisional patent application is that one year opportunity to further enhance and determine what it is you're doing while having something on file with the office and being able to use that term patent pending. Uh, another way to look at it as well is because it's good for a year, if you file that non-provisional within the year before that provisional uh, expires, you in fact have a 21 year patent term. So you're giving yourself that extra year. Um, and again, it allows you to, to talk to people with some level of confidence. Now, I think it is important to note though, a provisional patent application is not something that you can enforce against anyone. A non-provisional patent application is not something you can afford, enforce against anyone. It's only once you have that US patent in your hand that you can go back and enforce it against people who perhaps have, um, come up with something during the time your patent application was pending. Um, if you are seeking funds to develop a prototype from investors, how much info do you share with prospective investors? Um, interesting question. Um, and one that I probably don't have a good answer to, because that really goes to um, an aspect that's outside of the US Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, my answer here, however, would be one of caution in disclosing to investors or disclosing to someone who's making your prototype. Um, one, you may want to already have that provisional application on file before you start having those conversations, or at the very least, have them uh, uh, fill out a non-disclosure agreement. Because anytime you're disclosing your invention to anyone, you're starting a time clock running in the U.S., we have what's called a one-year grace period. Once you make a public disclosure of your invention, you have one year to seek patent protection. Now, with that said, in most every other country around the globe, uh, they don't have grace periods. There's a small number that do. 
for the most part, they, uh, other countries around the globe, once you've made a public disclosure, you cannot protect your invention. So when you're even having the kernel of an idea that you want to start talking to people about your invention, take a step back and think about what you're doing. Um, now, if you're having someone make a prototype, obviously you're going to have to disclose um, enough for them to make your prototype. So that's a pretty specific disclosure. Uh, that, that you're going to want to do very carefully, again, with the NDA or provisional application in place, uh, maybe even those layered on top of each other. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it is one o'clock, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you, Elizabeth, for spending time with us, answering questions. Um, it was a great presentation. Um, you will all receive an email with a link to the recording as well as an evaluation. I did post that evaluation in the chat as well. If you guys wouldn't mind filling it out, uh, just kind of helps us improve our sessions. Um, we do have two more, as mentioned, uh, upcoming uh, webinars with the USPTO. I posted those in the chat. You can also find the links to those uh, at virginiasbdc.org. One will be next Thursday and then the Thursday after, same time, 12 o'clock. Uh, also on our website, you can find the business recovery webpage we developed to help owners continue business operations during this challenging time. These detailed guidelines cover a broad range of critical considerations, ranging from safety and workplace guidance to financial assessments, marketing, and communications. You can use them by themselves, but they were designed to be used in collaboration with the business consultant at your local SPDC. We do have offices located throughout the state to assist you. Um, and if anyone is interested, we can um, set you up with counseling or have, if you have any questions, please email us. I put that email in the chat, help at virginiasbdc.org. Thank you everyone for attending and thank you again, Elizabeth. And we hope to see everyone next time. Wonderful. Thank you, Deandra. Thank you, Amanda. It was a pleasure being with you today. Bye-bye.